I have with me today a retired chief of police and a current city council member that I really wanted you to meet for a number of reasons. This is a guy who dedicated uh, his whole working life to his hometown, um, but he didn't stop there. And uh, one of the things that he's been involved in is writing and publishing a book that talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly of being a law enforcement officer. Chief, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me this morning. So talk about your career, how you decided to get into police work and, and, and how you rose to the top. Well, I never wanted to get in police work when I was younger. I kind of grew up, you know, poor here in Middletown, which is a lot of us here. And uh, I went to uh, school and college to be a math teacher, a basketball coach, and that was my goal. And then just after my junior year, I, I decided to take the police test and there's about 350 of us took it and they hired five of us. So that kind of set the tone. And my dad always told me, you know, you go to college to get a good job. And so I was offered a good job. And so I, I left and did that and went into police work and did everything from patrol to, you know, detectives to, to narcotics, then into supervision. And I became the chief when I was about 46 years old. Did that about five and a half years and I retired two years ago. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, what was the impetus for, um, for writing the book? just to, to humanize the profession. Um, this was a journal that I kept over 30 years. Started writing in the academy and at the advice of an academy commander um, who's ready to retire. And he had said, you know, I wish I had always kept a diary. And that's what he called it, a diary. And it just stuck with me. So every experience I had, whether I saw it, heard it, felt it, I wrote about over years. And uh, when I started writing at first, I was writing for fun. But by the time I became the chief, I was more writing for therapy. And uh, it was just a release and outlet for me to, to write what I experienced and um, didn't hold back on it. Um, beat myself a lot of that, but uh, real critical of uh, administrations that don't support their officers. And um, that's why I went out there. And so I had some friends in the media who encouraged me to release it. And, uh, and I did. And so it's, we're just shocked it's done so well nationally. I mean, never thought that. Well, and that's the thing. The book is is called Blue View. And when you go online and read the reviews of the book, people are really passionate about it and about the way that you truly, you do humanize the badge, but you don't sugarcoat the yeah. things that police officers deal with, including sometimes a lack of leadership. Yeah, lack of leadership is the number one problem in, in American policing. Um, too many people rise to the top with agendas to uh, for political career or whatever it might be. And, you know, that's, you know, I'm in a political career now being on city council. But, you know, one thing I've been very vocal about, if anybody reads it, is you have to back your people. That's why nobody wants to be a policeman these days. That's why uh, recruiting and, and academies are so down in numbers. And it starts at the top. And we have to make people want to do this. And we have to support them because it's one of the hardest jobs in the world. Um, I've often said, you know, it's the tagline in the book also, that the hardest thing about policing is you have to solve everybody else's problems when you can't solve your own. And administrators sometimes fail to see that. Right. And I mean, that's the thing that we talk so much about um, in police work is that we have to know uh, a lot about so many things. And yes. it, one of the things that you uh, dealt with in Ohio was the uh, the drug crisis, right? Like me, you worked in narcotics and then you dealt with it as the chief. How has, has drug enforcement and prevention changed since you were uh, a young cop in narcotics um, to now as a retired chief and a city councilman? It's changed because back in the day, you just worried about your own turf. You know, you didn't bring in task forces and the DEA or Homeland Security. But now with how it is with across the nation and coming up through, you know, Mexico and the cartel, we dealt with many things just here in Middletown, you know, a city of 50,000 people that came from, you know, we worked with the FBI and, and the federal government on drugs coming up from Mexico to San Diego. We were involved in indictments. So that sharing of information over time and us doing that with federal agencies has changed. When I was a younger officer, it was just about us protecting our city. Those days are over. It takes everybody to get involved in. And uh, to do that, you have to have total, total, you know, faith in, in the other agencies to do that. It's changed so much. 
And your officers have to be incredibly skilled at, you know, not just the enforcement end, but things like, you know, writing a good search warrant, writing a great report, um, utilizing electronic surveillance, all of those things that, you know, I think a lot of people would look at mid to small town law enforcement and think, oh, those guys are just, they're making traffic stops and finding lost dogs. That's not the case, is it? No, that's not the case at all. You know, back when I was a street cop, guys would stand on the corners and and people would wave them down, they'd sell dope, right? Well, those days are over with cell phones. Nobody stands on the corners anymore around here and sell it. It's all cell phones. So you don't have that luxury of just seeing the dealers on the corners. Um, those things have changed. So you have to do the search warrants for the phone records and things like that. And, and courts are funny about giving you those court orders to do that. They want to make sure everything's squared away. So it's just changed so much. It's I couldn't imagine starting a career in law enforcement right now because what they're getting ready to get into is unlike anything we had to deal with when I was younger. Yeah, boy, I, I sure agree with that. So in your, how long were you a police officer? 30 years. So in those 30 years, what have you seen concerning police officer mental health? Because I know that's kind of one of the themes of your book is, again, yeah. you know, most people um, will see, you know, a little bit of trauma and tragedy in their lifetime. Most cops see a lifetime of trauma and tragedy in those first couple of years on the job. And that takes a toll on us, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, and you know, one thing is, is, is police, we are very type A people and we, we want to be in control. We are in control a lot of times. So it's hard to go get help when you need it. When I was a younger officer, nobody ever talked about getting help. Now I see people all over the country encouraging it because when I say get help, I just mean find somebody to talk to and release don't take the job home with you. It's the biggest mistake most officers make, including myself. When you take it home, um, you, you take it out on your family, you're angry all the time because you're seeing the worst of society a lot of times. Find a minister, find a counselor, find somebody. Most departments will do EAP, you know, employee assistance program for free. And so I always encourage people to have somebody to talk to. And my talking to was writing. Writing really helped me release things that I can talk about. And so that's what the, it's on this book, but find whatever outlet you can and don't bring it home with you. Yeah, that's a really good point. Now we have entered into um, probably the worst period of time for American law enforcement than, than you and I have probably seen in our lifetimes um, where, you know, law enforcement is just constantly, uh, you know, vilified and, and, and one of the ways that some politicians are dealing with that is to take money out of our budgets, right? Defund the police. Yeah. And they do it very publicly. Some, some jurisdictions are taking police officers out of the schools. Um, they're they're um, taking away specialty units and things like that. Yeah. How does all that affect law enforcement from your perspective? affects it greatly. And it starts with the politicians. I mean, these same people make these laws and then get mad when the police enforce these laws. I've said that for years and there's nothing worse than that. And that's what happens with, with policing. It's become politicized to the point where politicians in the media are going to, they're going to do whatever they can to, and cater to the people that cry the loudest, even if those people are wrong. And that's what they do. So what it's done to policing is you have people now who just don't want to get into the profession. We go to these, uh, these colleges, these high schools and recruit, and they're like, there's no way I'm getting in that profession. You know, I used to want to do that, but if I do one thing wrong, it's going to be on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter within five minutes. And they, they don't want to deal with that. And I personally had several officers that came in that we had just hired within six months that I can't do this anymore. I can't do that. And it's not because they're, they're cowards or not. It's just because the, the constant scrutiny, you know, and they want to take away our training money. That's something people forget. Training is, is more important in policing than anything. And we and they take this money away and they defund through training and other methods and then get mad when you don't know what you're doing or you don't have certifications that you need. So that's just what the, way the world is right now, unfortunately. But the, the, the whole defunding is a joke because look at all these cities that have defunded and now they're paying for it and they're having homicide rates go through the roof. And that's a fact. That's you know, it's easy to research. Right. And I we're seeing this explosion in homicide, you know, from 30% to up to 90% increase in certain areas. Um, we're also seeing the uh, the the retail theft 
gangs and uh, and and just a, a complete lack of prosecution of um, what they used to call quality of life crimes. But now we're you know when when you're when you're uh, doing armed robberies and stealing tens of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise, um, yeah. doing drive-by shootings, this and that, and and yet we see such a limited prosecution in certain areas. That's incredibly frustrating to the cops, isn't it? Who, like you said, don't make the law, but they want us to enforce the law and to stop crime. How do you, how do we change that in America? I think it starts with, you know, and we say it all the time, it may not happen. Police chiefs have to stand up. They have to stand up and say, this is unacceptable. And you see some doing it. And that's incredible that they're doing that. Most don't want to lose their jobs. And in a lot of the bigger cities, those have become political positions. In the smaller cities, not so much. So they can probably get away with it. Chiefs have to stand up and say, it's enough. And, and they have to be able to, to do that without fear of losing their jobs. But even if they do, at some point, you have to stand up for what's right, not what's popular. And that's not been going on lately. And that's a problem. Absolutely. Now, most um, police leaders are not uh, fans of dealing with the media. What did you do as a chief? And what do you recommend other chiefs do to have a better relationship with the media? We had an open door policy with the media. I was never, ever except for one news station that just was hell-bent on making police look bad. But they knew they could come to us anytime. We didn't withhold information. We gave them what they asked for within reason, uh, as long as it wasn't under investigation. Um, but we would have like coffee, donuts for them when they come in. And you would be amazed when you build those relationships, how they take care of you. And they're still going to report their stories, but they're going to give you a heads up. And they're gonna let you know, hey, this is coming, we're doing this. It makes all the difference in the world. Um, the other thing also is I made it clear if, if they wanted to talk to an officer who was at a scene of something, you know, pretty cool, I allowed access to that. Most chiefs won't do that. Now, we might have our PIO in there with them when they're talking, but we allowed access to our people. And I think that went a long way here in the Cincinnati area to do that. So that's what we dealt with was Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio media the most. So it would just go a long way. Just sometimes let them have that. Um, I found out if you were no comment all the time, they're going to write what they want and they're going to make their own story if you just say no comment. So we, I never did that. Right. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Chief, what can we do better? You know, we've had, again, two years of vilifying the police, um, but law enforcement officers make mistakes. Um, what do you think that we can do better to engage our communities to um, uh, help our communities trust us in when we're out doing our jobs. Just be as transparent as possible. Um, if somebody wants to file a complaint on an officer, always tell them you have that right to file the complaint. You can come talk to anybody in here. Um, and, and one thing that we did that I think really made a difference is we had open community forums all over the city for years. So one day, one month we do it at a coffee shop. Next month we do it at a church. And you let people come ask the hard questions. And I didn't just go. I would take sergeants, detective dispatchers, you know, corrections officers, and we'd go there's a group and we'd say, ask away, ask whatever you want. And we would sit there and answer. Some of them were really hard, but that gained us so much trust in Middletown that um, I think it, it went a long way. But you're never going to make everybody happy in this job. You can sit and be as transparent as possible. There's always going to be five or 10% that nothing you say is going to matter to them. You have to understand you're going to have that and focus on the 90% that, that do listen. So I want to get back to the book a little bit because I am so fascinated by that. What, what were the most difficult chapters to write when you, and I know you had your diaries, but when you were really yeah. putting it together, getting it ready for the publisher, what was difficult? I was telling, that's a great question. Clarence Page with the Chicago Tribune, he's from this area and he got a hold of it. And the race issues, Clarence is, is a black journalist who's phenomenal. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. He's interviewed presidents, you know, and, um, but we talked about that, the race issues, um, because I was very candid about that. Um, I was very open about Sometimes, you know, I can see across the country are people would think that you look at the George Floyd situation or things like that. But police officers are so stereotyped when it comes to racist and like my black officers who are some of the best officers in the city, they're called racist here. <laughs> so you, you can't win. So when I would write in the book, 
um, about that. I'll talk about the racial issues. Those are the hardest parts um, because I was very candid and open about it. Also, the, the, the chief years when we would have, you know, homicides of children or we would have overdoses of parents who left children there. Those were always hard to write about. And when we did the audio book on Audible and iTunes, when I was reading them over again, because it's been years, um, your voice kind of cracks at times reading some of these stories and it's really hard to get through them. But it's good it's out there. And, and I can tell you um, that the whole book was hard to write, but there were certain stories that stick out in my mind the most. What was the most fun um, about writing the book and what were the most fun stories you had? The most fun, um, when I went to Washington, D.C., you know, I was a guest of, of Congress to, to the State of the Union uh, at the Capitol, which was incredible. That was fun to write about. And then the other thing, just being in a patrol car with officers, there's a lot of funny stuff in there that I'm sure cops can relate to. And I always say cops aren't impressed by other cops. This book will appeal more to people who've never done the job, because I guarantee you half the cops across the nation have read this or will read it and say, yeah, I've done that. So just the fun stuff in a car that, you know, and, and you know, we try not to embarrass anybody. I've had nothing but positive response from guys I worked with for years in a car or in narcotics. And so it went really well. Um, but it's just the, my drug year is incredible working in the drug unit. That was awesome. That was awesome. So, you know, hopefully it, it's uh, people enjoy it when they read it. That's fantastic. Now, I want to, because you kind of glossed over it, but I want people to know that you were invited to Washington, D.C. I want you to talk about that experience. Yeah, I was invited to the state, of the, the presidential state of the union and got to go with Congressman Warden Davidson. And he was just really excited about the work we did in Midtown with the community reducing the, the opioid problem. And so I, I was in Vegas at the time. So they, I flew out to Washington on a red eye. And uh, I got to go to the Library of Congress with, you know, Supreme Court and, you know, all the Republicans and Democrats. And I sat in there and I was literally with the most powerful people in the world in that room. And it was, un it was surreal. And I'm thinking, man, I'm just some hillbilly from Middletown, Ohio. <laughs> How did I get here? You know, so, but it was one of the most incredible things just to be in the room with such people um, that you're just like, man, this is crazy. I'm 100 feet from President Trump and Mike Pence and the Supreme Court. And even some of the Democratic senators in Congress were ultra nice to me. You know, they asked what I did. I told them they were, they just asked a lot of questions, they were friendly. So it's just a whole different environment than what I've seen on TV. So that was phenomenal for me. That was in 2019. That's awesome. And, and your yeah. city has been, um, you know, we talked about uh, and uh, we talked about narcotics, but yeah. I want to talk specifically about the uh, opioid problem that we still have in the, in the United States. I mean, it's, it's horrific. It, it, it kills more people than almost anything else in this country. Yeah. And yet you still don't hear about it enough. And, yeah. uh, and we still don't really have a handle on it. What are your thoughts about how the United States is going to get a handle on this opioid problem that we have. It starts with the federal government. We can do all the state and local programs we want. It's not flowing in from the state and local areas. It's flowing in from other countries. The federal government, they have to have a desire and a priority to stop this. And we talk so much about a wall and we talk so much about borders. It's, it comes in from everywhere. Um, but until the federal government takes it serious and says, we want to stop it, it's not going to get stopped. I know it's not probably the answer you were looking for, but state and, and local, we're limited what we can do. If it, it's coming in so fast, we have to stop it for, at the borders. We have to. And when people say, we don't need this, we don't need that, but then they complain, well, look at all the drugs in the city. Well, it doesn't come from Middletown, Ohio. It doesn't come from Dayton. We all know where it's coming from. The only one can stop that is the federal government. It's their call. Right. And it's and I know it is very frustrating for state and local law enforcement because, you know, we can maybe stop it a little bit at our borders. But, you know, our borders of our states or our cities. But uh, but I happen I live near the southern border and um, our officers down here, you know, police officers, state troopers and Border Patrol agents are making these massive fentanyl arrests, just massive. But for every one of those massive arrests there's probably 40 more shipments that get yeah. through and end up where? In communities like yours, right? Yeah, well, I, I likened it one time, if, if you live by a river 
and your house and the river floods and your house has water in it every day, do you just keep cleaning up the water or do you find a way to stop the river flow? So Chief, you had this fantastic 30 year career. You ended up at the very top. You retired just a couple of years ago, but then you decided, oh, what the heck, I'll throw my hat in the ring uh, politically. I talk about talk about that decision. Uh, my decision to do that was based on the community just asking me to. You know, um, we had such support here in Middletown, um, everywhere. It was just amazing. And police and fire has been cut from Middletown unbelievably. When I got hired in 1990, we had 95 officers. Right now, we have 70. We're short 25 officers from the 90s. We have double the crime. We've annexed a lot of area. Public safety is just not a priority here. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're going to make public safety a priority. Chief, where can people find the book and where can they find you on social media? Um, the book is on, it, it's this right here. It's called The Blue View and it's on Amazon right now. Um, you can go on there. It's got great reviews. It's a five-star rating. And some really cool people read it across America. Um, but you can go there. It's on Audible on Amazon or iTunes um, on Apple. Um, I'm all over. If you just Google my name, uh, Rodney Meterspall, I'm on Facebook. We have a pretty good following there. We just try to get the word out. Um, and on Twitter, I think it's Chief Meterspall. It's my Twitter from them. But um, we just try to get the word out that if you want to read this book, um, I think if you're a police officer, you'll appreciate it. If you're not a police officer, you'll come to appreciate more. Real quick, one thing I love about it is academies across the country are, are buying it. And having recruits read it, which we were so excited about that, we never thought that would happen. So hopefully that's something that, that other schools will do. And uh, we just appreciate the, the support. Chief, thanks for spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Ma'am, put the gun down! Put the gun down! Last year, Law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.